Thank you for coming out tonight in the snow. My name is Renee, and I'm with Transition Town here in Exeter. Um, I seek to reduce the carbon footprint of this town, and I collaborate with any individual or organization seeking to do the same. So tonight, we're bringing you Button Up New Hampshire through New Hampshire Saves. This is our third year hosting here at the library. Um, and I, I see a couple in the crowd here that want to host it at their own town, so I'm very happy about that. Atkinson and Kingston, or East Kingston, might be having one as well. Um, before I introduce Bruce to you, I'd like to tell you that um, I applaud your efforts to come here tonight to try to reduce your energy and reduce your carbon footprint. I'm sure you're seeing in the news that new pipelines want to come, right, running down Route 101 to bring more natural gas to the area, which is kind of okay as a transition, but we want to work towards more clean and renewable energies. So um, I'm working on something to help um, ask Governor Snoodoo to appoint a task force to uh, investigate offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine, which is, has huge potential to basically power the whole state. But in the meantime, I applaud you for reducing your, your energy so that we can just have less pipelines in the meantime, because I think it's just going to be a stranded asset. So that's about me. Um, I have all your emails, and if you need, um, and I'll send you an email after this thanking you for coming in. If you have further questions, you can just reply to that email, and I can send you out his PowerPoint and contact information um, for the button up people and anything like that. So thank you for your email. Help yourself to pizza if you want, and I'm just going to send it over to Bruce here. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Um, as Renee mentioned, my name is Bruce Bennett. I'm with GDS Associates. We're a an engineering consulting company that works on both sides of the supply and the demand side. So we help utilities and, and gas companies on the supply side. We also help them on the demand side, de designing and developing energy efficiency programs. Um, and then we also work with end users, property owners, to help them reduce their energy usage, which impacts their bottom line. Okay. Um, so what we're going to go through is just some energy use savings tips, you know, how to stay warm, and first of all, I'm going to apologize for cheating a little bit because I didn't develop this PowerPoint. Somebody else did, and this is my second time doing it. So I'm going to cheat a little bit and use the screen for prompts. But So we're going to go through this. Just some air sealing, insulation concepts, um, just keeping it real basic. Some of the health, health and safety concerns that come along with not doing certain things and doing certain things. Um, and then working with professionals, uh, working with energy auditors and energy raters. Um, and then how to tie in and use the uh, utility uh, incentive programs. Is there anybody here from any of the four sponsoring utilities? Eversource, Liberty, Electric Co-op, or Unitil? I think Gordon Tuttle was planning to come tonight from Eversource, but I haven't seen him yet. So we'll go through those programs and, and how they can help achieve our goals here. Um, so in general, New Hampshire spends a ton of money on energy all sorts of energy, um, over $6 billion a year. Um, this chart here kind of shows you how that's broken up and it will kind of help direct <coughs> how we can impact the use of that energy. You can see space heating and other consumes a huge amount of that. And we'll go through what those are. All right, so the first step is getting to know your energy bill. So you can, electric anyway. And you can see how the supply charges and the demand charges um, are broken out, the delivery charges rather. <clears throat> so you can use that and then compare yourself to what the average is. So you have 20 kilowatt hours uh, is the typical um, average usage. Um, and then monthly, 600. And that's what your monthly bill would be based on. Okay. So how much energy does a um, typical appliances use? There's ways of figuring out. You can use a watt meter, which are available for most New Hampshire public libraries. Does Exeter have these available? Yes, they do. You can take it out just like a book, just like a library book. Yeah. And I mean, if you can't get it from there, they're also available uh, for purchase, I think, in the NH Saves catalog. The, there are most of the items in there are subsidized through the um, systems benefit charge. Um, also, on appliances, you can look at the nameplate data. And this nameplate data contains information that you can use to figure out the watts. If it doesn't have the watts clearly printed on it, you can use volts and amperage to calculate the watts. And that's simply amps times volts gives you watts. 
Okay, so doing that simple math, it was a, <clears throat> everything's based on a kilowatt hour, so you take that watt hour and divide that by a thousand to get kilowatt hours. So, for example, a 300 watt television went on, um, maybe it's on three hours a day. So that's 300 watts times three hours, gives you 300 watt hours. Or per year, 365 days, that's 328,500 watt hours. <clears throat> or 328 and a half kilowatt hours. Um, I just got my electric bill and I was shocked. Yeah, if, but by the way, feel free to ask questions as I go through this and we can have back and forth dialogue. Yeah. TV set, average use per day, three hours. But today, TVs are on all the time, whether yes. you turn them on or not. Correct. So yep. what would that be? Would that be the new one that's plugged in and then jumps up to a higher wattage when you actually turn it on? That's when it's it on and being used, correct. I'll, I'll get into phantom loads okay. and some of the, yeah, in just a minute. But you're right, they are, technically they're on all the time. Lots of things are, not just TV, but, yeah. All right, so just some of the other approximate usage. I mean, look at refrigerators here, it's 1,050. Now that's a typical refrigerator, a typical new refrigerator now, a, you know, a, a large new refrigerator is six to 700 kilowatt hours. And I don't even think that's an Energy Star labeled refrigerator. So this is including refrigerators, you know, older models. Does anybody here remember the refrigerators that were brown or avocado, Harvest Gold? <coughs> If we ever saw one of those when we were doing an energy audit, we didn't even have to meter it. We just said immediately get that out of here because we knew it was gonna be 3,000 kilowatt hours at least. Hmm. Uh, I metered my own refrigerator when I, when I replaced it. It was about 10 to 12 years old and it metered at 1,300 kilowatt hours a year. So I, I, excuse me, I replaced that with one that used 450 kilowatt hours a year. And I, within the first month I noticed that I was building. <laughs> Yeah. When you're talking about old, are you talking about 10 years old, old, 12 years old, 20 years, what are you talking about? The refrigerator about? that I got rid of that I metered was 1,300 kilowatt hours a year. Yeah. Was installed in my house in the late 80s. Oh, okay. And I replaced it um, about six years ago. All right. So, about that vintage. Yeah. So about six years ago, the refrigerator I bought was, you know, 500, it was an Energy Star model. Okay. And it was about 500 kilowatt hours. So something that's 10 years old wouldn't be as bad as what you were talking about. Correct. Okay. But like I said, if you, if you have any questions about what your appliance is using, yeah. you can actually meter it with one of those watt meters. <clears throat> um, obviously, shut things off when not in use. That's kind of goes without saying. But how do you do that when so many things, even um, cell phone chargers that are plugged in and not charging a phone, I've shined them with my infrared camera and there's heat coming off of that transformer, which means it's, it's drawing a small phantom load, even though it's not charging anything. Um, anything with an internal time clock, like these smart televisions you're talking about, um, has a little bit of draw all the time. Um, DVRs, um, uh, cable, cable, um, we call them cable box. But anything, <clears throat> anything with an internal time clock um, you really, there's a reason why it's drawing a little power all the time, is to keep that little clock going all the time. Um, so they do make these smart strips, which allow you to control certain devices so that some devices that need to maintain that clock can do so, um, and then others can go off. So when that device goes off, it's off. Okay, um, turn down the water heater. Turning down your water heater, um, to 120 degrees, so there's 120 degrees at the tap. Um, we'll, we'll save on water heating costs, whether it's a gas or electric. Um, dehumidifiers, um, recommended to set it at 70% maximum humidity instead of trying to really dry it out all the time. And that will get you um, where you need to be in terms of internal relative humidity um, without breaking the bank. A okay, washing clothes in cold water. Um, I know I don't do the laundry in my house. I have to admit, <coughs> but 
I do know that washing things in cold water is often better for your clothes, too. <laughs> so I've been told. Um, what about a tankless water heater? Yeah. That's, that's yep. tough. It is. Uh, a tankless water heater, I work a lot in new construction, so we help builders build energy efficient new construction. And we actually see a lot of tankless water heaters going in now. Um, but there's a snapback effect with those. Um, okay, so we're not, we don't have the standby losses by maintaining a tank at a certain temperature all the time, regardless of whether or not anybody's even home, on vacation, it's maintaining that water temperature all the time. <coughs> but there's something that National Grid um, researched several years ago, it's called the teenager effect. If you rely on that tank to go empty in order to get your teenager out of the shower, you're gonna have increased energy use with the on-demand water heater because they'll never come out of the shower. Um, but kidding aside, there is a, with the on-demand water heater, depending on the distance to the tap, there can be well pumping power, um, water usage, so it's not energy necessarily, but it's a resource altogether. You're using more water while you're standing there waiting for, for, it, to warm up. for it to warm up. So a lot of the on-demand water heater companies now have a well, if they don't have it built in, they recommend that you have one off to the side. It's a recirculation, um, a research pump. Um, so we have a builder that just installed one in a house up in Webster, and what he did is he put it on an occupancy sensor. So when someone comes into the bathroom, it starts that little pump. Before they even touch the tap, that little pump is starting to move the water to the tap. So it's really, these are the types of control technologies that are uh, really starting to help. Uh, okay, lighting, LED. This has been the greatest thing in my opinion. It was when I first started helping out PSNH before they were ever sourced uh, with their programs. We were you know, promoting compact fluorescent light bulbs, which contained mercury, and the lighting was, you know, not great all the time. Uh, it was tough to get the, the color rendering right. But the LEDs have kind of really, really <coughs> taken hold in the marketplace. Um, and starting to replace a lot of the compact fluorescent light bulbs that are out there. Um, cost has come way down. Uh, you can get them through the NHH catalog as well. Uh, but you have all different possibilities now. When I first got into this about 10 years ago, LED light was really only used for lighting that your eye looked directly towards. So like at signage, exit signs. That was the primary use of uh, LED lighting uh, for energy efficiency. Now it can be used for general light. Uh, and you have all the different color, color temperatures, so you have you know, daylight versus the 27 Kelvin, which is the warm, kind of warm glow, kind of similar to an incandescent. And a lot of, a lot of people like that 700 Kelvin. Uh, where again, 5,000 Kelvin gets you closer to natural daylight. And some people don't like that to, to light their interior spaces. Okay. Um, some of the other energy saving um, tips out there, using low, low flow shower heads, low flow aerators. Not only does it save water, but you're pumping that water. In most places in New Hampshire, in a well, you're, you're pumping that. That's well power. Um, and you're heating that water. Uh, hot water pipe, R3 to R5. Um, New Hampshire building code takes it, takes it above and beyond what's in the national code, and they add it. Uh, they add to, to that base R value, they actually require R4 um, in new construction. <clears throat> Again, I mentioned smart plugs, hubs and switches, Energy Star labeled appliances. So this blue label um, was developed by the EPA and the U.S. Department of Energy jointly. Um, and it was done so for the purposes of not only identifying consumer products that were energy efficient, but that were also <coughs> maintained at a certain quality standard. So back in the 80s when you bought something that said energy efficient, you were like, okay, great, this is gonna be energy efficient, but what's it gonna cost me? It's gonna cost me something else in quality, I'm sure, it's got it. Because that was the case. A lot of these energy efficient products back then were energy efficient, but and you gave up something on the other side. Well, they came up with this label to identify products that were not only energy efficient, but also maintain a minimum quality standard. <clears throat> um, so some of the rebates. Um, 
I believe these are still current, but um, <clears throat> the utilities are coming up on their year end. They'll, they're about to get a new budget starting in January. Uh, so I'm assuming these rebate, rebates will continue. Um, but for electric clothes dryers, that's an Energy Star labeled um, clothes dryer. Um, it's kind of the highest rebate right now. But clothes washers are at 30. Um, dehumidifiers, 25. Refrigerators and clothes. Uh, room air conditioners at $20 each. Um, in, in the refrigerator um, rebate, that includes um, freezers as well. Okay. Um, they do have a free hallway. Uh, so they'll take away your old refrigerator. Um, Who's paying? Uh, through the NH Saves program. Yeah. They, they, they have a contractor that does it for them, but it's not through NH Saves. Okay, so uh, we have to heat our homes uh, to live in New Hampshire and stay warm, right? It's a fact. Um, you, the goal is to use less energy to heat our homes and and stay warm and comfortable. Uh, we're buying BTUs. We're buying BTUs off the grid or from some source. Right? And we're using those BTUs to warm our house. The idea is to keep those BTUs in the house as long as possible. You pay for them. So to control them, you control them through insulation and air sealing. Right? So heat always moves from warm to cold, never the other way around. Okay, it's always from areas of high pressure, high concentration to areas of low concentration. And heat doing that does it in three different ways, conduction, convection, and radiation. All right, um, convection, let's talk about that. That's, you know, our energy geeks, we talk about conduction and convection all the time. But what we're really talking about is air leakage. Convection is the energy transfers through the circulatory motion of water or air, in this case air. Um, so cold air being drawn in at the bottom, being forced out at the top. That's the driving force. The driving force is the heat moving to cold through convection. So that's energy transfer through the movement of air. Controlling that, um, you control that energy loss by air sealing, by controlling that convective losses. Um, and you control it by stopping the cold air being drawn in at the bottom, but remember the driving force is really heat moving to cold. So you'd want to start at the top. Okay, this is kind of a trick question. We used to ask people this all the time. Does heat rise? Everybody thinks, oh, heat rises. No, warm air does rise and rides a loft of colder air. But in general, heat transfers equally 360 degrees depending on temperature differential or delta T. Okay, so Again, some of the low-cost, no-cost options, turn down the heat, use programmable thermostats, remove the window ACs when, in the wintertime. Um, and then I, I go into a lot of, mostly new homes, but I find a lot of homes um, where the windows are closed, but they're not latched. And before we ever do a blower door test, which I will explain, explain that in a minute, we go around and make sure all the windows are not only closed, but latched and latch correctly because sometimes when you turn the window latch it doesn't actually catch the clasp and close the window it actually forces the window open i've gone into rooms and heard you know heard that whistling and said oh something's open in here somewhere and i found just that where the window wasn't quite properly latched and air was being drawn in through that opening so much so that i could hear it um, okay again convection Warm air moving out at the top, cold air being drawn in at the bottom. And it's that circulatory motion of air that's driving that loss. So you want to start at the top, then go to the basement. Again, it's, it identifies them in that order because in most cases, these areas are still accessible with minimal surgery, so to speak. And the basement. In most homes, you can get to these areas without tearing into walls. Now, starting to do air sealing in this part of the building. Now you may have to start to remove some baseboard, window trim, and start to do a little more surgery in order to get to these areas to air seal. I, I have a question. Yep. If, if the air the hot air goes out the upstairs, if you have a two-story home and you're no longer using the second 
second floor so you're leaving the heat at 50. Is that a bad idea? Should you be heating your second floor? That's not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea to control the, the zone. And, right. Yeah, the sure. zone yeah. separately and we just close the doors, but are we thinking our heat go up to that area? Um, it, it is driven by yeah, delta T, so you might be driving the delta T between the first floor and the second floor. You probably will have a stronger connection at that point than you do through the, the upper level. But the good news is you've reduced your heat loss at the top going up to the attic yeah. and to the outdoors. Okay. Right. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a place in this presentation to get into it, but the other benefit, and this gets into that quality thing I was talking about. Right? You're controlling energy loss by stopping warm air getting into your attic. But moisture always comes along with that warm air. So that moisture goes along with the warm air. So if you're stopping heat loss to the attic, you're also stopping moisture from getting into your attic. And attics are typically not a place you want moisture. Um, and that adds to the building durability. Okay. Um, Attic hatches and pull down stairs, very common areas. These are all very common areas of air leakage in existing homes. Um, <clears throat> like I said, attic hatches and pull down stairs, chimney chasers. So where chimneys come up through the middle of a house, um, by fire code, you have to have a two inch clearance between the chimney and combustible material, wood and paper and that type of thing. Um, so typically there's a two inch gap around that chimney. But not all materials are combustible. So you could actually close that gap off with some tin pan flashing and close that off with metal. And then, you know, air seal that up with some, you know, heat caulk, heat silicone, high temp silicone, and then bury that in a non-combustible insulation material like rock wool. And it doesn't have to be the whole area of the attic, just around the chimney. You can use other material to insulate the rest of the attic, but right around the chimney, you can use rock wool and an air barrier. So that stops your convection and your conductive losses. Um, around electric penetrations and plumbing penetrations, around bath fan housings, you can see the bath fan here is, is peppered with holes. And that's all opportunity for heat transfer through convection getting into your attic. Can lights, very common problem. Okay, um, leaky ductwork. Um, so ductwork in basements and attics, you can get at these ducts and you can seal it with a mastic, which is a type of a putty compound. Um, you see a lot of people brushing it on in new construction, but in retrofit situations, um, the, the technique that I've seen work really well is to put on a kind of a rubber glove there and then put a cotton glove over that and then just use the glove to smear it on like you would with a brush. It's just a lot more effective because you can reach around the duct and seal around those joints. Um, the one thing you don't want to do to, to seal duct is use duct tape. They should call it, you know, fix everything but duct tape. <clears throat> well, why is that? Um, most duct tape adhesive doesn't last very long on, on, on metal that's being heated and cooled and eventually it falls off. Yeah. Now that's, you know what I'm talking about by duct tape. It's the, the stuff that we always make, we make baseballs out of those kits. Um, there is a foil HVAC tape that is appropriate for sealing ductwork, and that does have an elastomeric compound on it, and you can seal these joints with that. A lot of HVAC contractors use that um, in new construction in lieu of this compound. But in retrofit situations, it's very difficult to get around a duct and take these joints. It's a lot easier just to get, get in there and smear around um, the mastic. Okay. Um, again, this is what I was talking about before. Okay, so all that warm air getting into the cold attic is carrying moisture with it. And as soon as that moisture comes in contact with a cold surface, a surface that's at the dew point temperature, it condenses into water. And now you've got water in its liquid form in its gas form, it's not really that big a deal. It's when it comes in contact with a cold surface and turns into liquid water, that's where it becomes a problem. Um, so by controlling that heat loss to the attic, you're also controlling the potential for a mold situation. 
But I do, I, I do like to share some of these stories, that I, things I've seen over the years. Um, and we had somebody that had an attic that had a lot of moisture running out the gable end vents. And they couldn't figure out how do we get, how do we, how do we deal with this moisture? Where's it coming from? And how do we stop it? So they increased the attic ventilation. Well, they increased the amount of water running out their attic vents. So they sealed it all up. They sealed up, they went in, did a great job air sealing the attic. They put in good insulation. They still had moisture coming out the gable end vents. So, okay, well, let's go looking for the hot tub or the sauna or the big fish tank or plumbing leak. Where's this moisture coming from? And when we found four cords of green cordwood stored in the basement, we figured out where the moisture was coming from. That was drying out, it's desorbing. All that moisture is just transpiring up into the, part, the warm part of the building, the warmer part of the building, and being transferred to the cold attic, and then running out the gable end vents. We took away the green cordwood, problem went away, and then they actually had more ventilation in the attic than they needed. Okay, so air sealing opportunities in basements and crawl spaces. The door. A lot of new homes even today, a lot of builders, not a lot, but some, are not putting a door where the bulkhead goes out. Putting a door now makes the basement closer to the house than it does to outdoors. Um, there's typically a very strong connection between a conditioned first floor of a basement, uh, first floor of a home, in an unconditioned basement. There's usually a much stronger connection between those two spaces than there is between the basement and outdoors. <clears throat> and it would be my recommendation to keep it that way and in increase, in fact, that connection between the first floor and the basement by sealing out um, the doors, the band joist, um, you know, up above the sill plates in this area here. So up on top of the foundation wall, you have your sill plate, typically a very leaky area, um, and it's a huge opportunity for air sealing in existing homes. Um, and then in this framing assembly right here, where you have all these framing components coming together, and there's typically um, a lot of air infiltration at that point. And again, you might see, well, that air, air infiltration is coming into a basement. It's an unconditioned basement, so what? But as I said, there's often a very strong connection between that first floor heated space and the unheated basement. Can I ask you a question? So this is such a basic question, but I don't know the answer. That's okay. So around all your old basement windows and then those boards around the top, I have someone's, when I moved in, there's insulation, but it's like raw insulation, kind of just jammed in those little spaces. Like this? Uh, yes, and so so I bought a roll because some of that insulation had to come out mm -hmm. for some whatever I had to work something done. So it has paper on it. So do I put the paper side toward the outside of the building or toward the inside of my basement? In this part of the world, you want it on the inside of the basement okay. because you always that's a, that paper is a vapor barrier, okay. and you want to stop that water vapor while it's still in its gas form. So you want to stop it at the warm side. If you put it on the cold side, it would be, you'd get the condensation on the paper because it would, in theory, be cold. So is it better then for me to take all this stuff that is just loose insulation out and put all the paper in that space? Put the paper side in? No. Yeah. No, you said put the paper side. So this is the wall of my outside house. Yeah. And here's my basement in here. Yep. You're telling me to put the paper here, I mean, not here, right? Correct. Okay, so is it better to just take all the loose stuff out and then just fill it with ones that, that have paper and put the paper on the side? They don't, it has no paper, that stuff I had. To, it's just like that stuff. They just stuffed it with loose insulation. Oh, oh, just, oh. Yes. Hmm. How do they do that without the loose insulation falling <laughs> out? Well, because of the way the wood is cut, you know what I mean? They, there's, just friction? there's these little boxes. There's kind of like little boxes all around, yeah. you know, from where the two by fours are and stuff. Yeah. Um, to answer your question, I would put, if you have material with a vapor barrier on it, the paper face, yep. and if it's on there and it's the wrong way, you remove it and flip it around. so that Right, but it isn't. It's just loose. The paper's there. There's no they paper. have no paper. Oh, there's no, no paper. There's no paper. It's just loose insulation. Yeah. Is the basement heated? 
a little bit of it is. Not yeah. all of if it you is. had dedicated heat down there, um, New Hampshire Building Code requires that you have an effective vapor retarder on the winter warm side of your assemblies. So that's walls and heat situations. Okay. So the, a better a better opportunity would be to do something like this. We would get some rigid insulation, some rigid foam board, and cut it to fit in those bays and leave it, leave a little gap so that you can seal it in place with spray foam. See now you've addressed the, the added insulation, you've also added your vapor barrier, and then you've air sealed it to stop convective losses. I thought foam had to have some kind of backing like sheetrock or something, a fire barrier. It doesn't? Um, if it's exposed, it just foam like that? In, 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 well, what a lot of people do is they put the foam in there first and then they cover it with a bat, and that's been acceptable. The most building they cover it the other five blasts. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There is foam that is fire rated. There is some foam that has a, a skin on it. Yeah, there's a particular <coughs> brand out there. Thermax is one brand that I know of. Um, and I'm sure there's probably others. I just don't know the other names on top of my head. But there are some foams that have a fire rating. Uh, but you're right, you do need to have something on there um, to satisfy the fire code. Now the question, when, if you look at the illustration on the left, the block wall, cinder block has holes that have, so if you, yeah. put the, if you put the foam up against the sill plate and the outside wall, mm -hmm. do you have to have a thickness of foam that will cover those holes somehow, or just put foam in the holes? In this particular detail here, I would actually slide something in there and cut a piece of rigid foam and lay it in horizontally oh, okay. and seal it in that way, yeah. In, in a regular concrete, solid concrete wall, yeah. you'd still have air sealing to do where the sill plate meets that concrete. Because wood on top of concrete, even with a little foam gasket material, is irregular. And there's always going to be air that's drawn through that sill, that sill seal. Is there another reason why you don't want that picture in the middle besides that there's no um, vapor barrier? Yes. <laughs> Good question. Um, this, partic this pink fluffy stuff, and I'm not picking on fiberglass, but um, only achieves its nominally rated R value if it's fully lofted at its design thickness and cut with no gaps and no compression. So the illustration here in this photograph is that this bat is crammed in there, it's compressed, there's gaps all around it, and if that bat is rated for R21, for example, it's probably barely achieving R10. Where it's insulated, you can see there's gaps all around it. And there's also probably a very bad air, air barrier there, I can't really tell from the photograph, but uh, that's, that's the point. The point is it's poorly insulated, and there's a very poor air sealing in that location. Um, okay, so like I said, center of the house. Now we're getting to a little more tricky stuff. So, uh, but where you'd want to target this um, to reduce the amount of so-called surgery in the house is to target the outlets. Use gaskets around electric outlets, old windows that have pulleys. They make little covers for those. Um, add weather stripping where you can, different types of weather stripping and door sweeps. So if you have an unconditioned basement, uh, old farmhouse with rubble basement, it's just unfinished, cold basement. Um, you'd want to have a door sweep on the bottom of that door and add some of that weather stripping around the door. Um, these balloons, they make, there are products out there that you can put in some of these old chimneys. I did a blower door test on an old farmhouse in Derry uh, many years ago now. I couldn't even get enough pressure to get a reading on the fan because there's <coughs> five chimneys None of them had even a damper in them. Now, even if they did have a damper in them, they would still leak. Um, this particular house had no damper, and so there was obviously a lot of opportunity for air sealing. So we recommended they went in and just put some of these uh, inflatable sells? balloons. Where can you get those? <sighs> I online. don't. You can get them online. I think you can get them through the NA Sage catalog, but I, I'm not positive about that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a chimney balloon. I mean, there are different products out there, different manufacturers that, that make them, but um, I believe NH Sage would be the first place at start. Um, and, the, and the place that services the NH Sage catalog is, um, so if you can't find it there, that catalog is maintained by EFI, uh, Energy Federation Inc. 
dot com, I believe. EFI dot com. You know, they have all sorts of energy efficiency products. But I'd start with NHC because you get some of that cost subsidized through the New Hampshire Utilities Program. Um, okay, so air sealing and fresh air. We hear this a lot where, you know, especially in new construction, well, we don't want to over tighten the house because it'll create a sick house. And, um, as I mentioned before, by tightening house, in most cases, you're improving the durability and the quality of the home by controlling moisture from getting into places you don't want it. Okay? Um, but typically, it, it, what, they're, what they really mean is by don't over tightening the house, they're saying don't under ventilate the house. So the concept is to build the house tight and then ventilate it properly. Get as tight as you can possibly get it, and then if there's a, a tightness issue, then you control that ventilation mechanically. To just let a house breathe, you have no idea how much ventilation you're getting. Um, you're really just kind of guessing. You know, if I stood here with my mouth open and didn't control the air that got into my lungs by breathing mechanically, so to speak, I'd fall down on the floor <clears throat> because you re it requires that temperature differential or pressure differential in order to make airflow. So in a house. You have no control over it if you're just guessing. If you have a hole in a wall and you want air to move through that, you need to have a pressure difference or a temperature difference in order to start that air moving back and forth. And sometimes you just don't have that, particularly in the shoulder months. All right. Um, but in most cases, uh, most homes, existing homes, are two to four times uh, leakier than they really need to be. Um, they put that comment in here about nosebleed dry in winter. We see a lot of people. And okay, another quick story. I'm sorry, Renee. I'm, uh, digress a little bit. In my own house, my wife used to put a pot of water on the wood stove because it got dry. Well, then I went around and did some air sealing. Well, what happened? I created a mold problem because the water that was evaporating off the wood stove was now creating mold on some of the baseboards in the in the finished part of the basement. So I said, okay, we don't need the water on the wood stove anymore. So that nosebleed dry wasn't that the fact that, you know, we were heating with wood and that was drying out the house. It was the fact that the house was so leaky that the moisture that was getting into the air was just leaking out, making the house more dry. And the cold air being drawn in, because cold air holds less moisture than warm air, that cold winter air that was coming in was dry. <clears throat> People think that about forced hot air heat. Oh, forced hot air heat is dry. We have to add humidification to it. Not really. Not if you control the convective losses in the house and by sealing your ductwork, you won't need to add humidification to these systems. Okay, so that's kind of the, the point I was getting at earlier. Seal it tight, ventilate it right. Uh, okay, so by get the house as tight as you can possibly get it and then control it mechanically. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean use this whole air-to-air -air heat exchanger. What you may need, you may need a balanced <coughs> system like this in a really tight house. But in most cases, you can do it with an exhaust-only fan. Okay. Now, with an exhaust-only fan, you're wiring a fan that you know exhausts air when you need it so that you get proper air exchange. But you are relying on building leakage for the air, the makeup air to be coming in, so the warm air gets exhaust it out through the fan, cold air drawn in wherever it can get it. But that is, that is an effective ventilation strategy. Okay. Um, now bath fans. When I bought my house, I had this type of situation. The bath fan was just dumping into the attic. It wasn't even venting to the outdoors, contributing to a mold situation. All right, so yes, vent it to the outside. Don't vent it into the attic. Um, using a solid pipe instead of the uh, flexible pipe is better because now you've got better flow. You don't have the static pressure. An 80 cubic feet per minute fan connected to 15 feet of flex duct probably isn't going to achieve 80 CFM of air movement because of that, <clears throat> the length of the pipe first of all, and then the, uh, the flex duct is often uh, increases that static pressure and reduces the flow. So you get much better flow from a bath fan with a nice, smooth, straight pipe with as minimal turns as possible. 
But where do you take that bath fan um, exhaust duct? Do you take it through the roof or the, the vent or you take it out the side of the house? Good question. Um, a lot of people go out through the soffit and drop it out through the soffit. Now that's not ideal because if you poked it out through the soffit and put a little termination vent out there and you have soffit venting all the way along there and a ridge vent across the top of the roof, what happens in a lot of cases is you vent the moisture out through the soffit and if there's a slight breeze going this way outside, it just gets drawn in through the soffit next to it. So it's you really want it to get up and away so that it goes out into the ambient air. So yes, ideally go out through a sidewall if you can, um, and then you can go actually straight up through the roof and put a roof vent, mm -hmm. and that's, that's a good way to do it too. Uh, in my case, not so much because I have a metal roof, and that would be kind of mm -hmm. challenging to get a roof vent. <clears throat> okay, so we talked about, I talked about the cordwood, um, but a dirt basement, dirt crawl spaces, that's a huge source of moisture. Even if you look down there and it looks fairly dry, you have soil gases and moisture coming up through the, the soil all the time. Um, again, bath fans being vented into attics, bathrooms without fans at all, um, and disconnected clothes dryers. Some people were going to this one house and they were drink, venting their dryer into a bucket. <laughs> yeah, it didn't work very well. Um, plants, humans breathing. We're not saying you stop breathing. We don't say choke the dog because you know. <laughs> but yeah, respiration puts moisture in the air. Um, open sump pump holes. They make lids to cover these holes. In new construction, um, we have a very standardized size of sump pump hole. They make lids that fit right over there. Stop the evaporation of the water from the sump pump back into the house. Um, New construction material, new concrete, they say it takes seven years to fully cure, and in that time, it's drying out. It's a lot of moisture in concrete. Um, new construction lumber is always desorbing, so there's always moisture coming out of new lumber. Installed, you know, lumber is supposed to be kiln dried to 15 to 18 percent moisture content, but if it's sitting out outdoors during construction, it absorbs water and it's releasing water, it's absorbing water. Not until the house is closed up does it really start to really begin to dry effectively. But until then, where does that moisture go? It's going right back into the house. Um, control indoor air pollution, right? So this gets back to the health and safety. You build a really tight building, you really want to control some of the indoor pollutants as well. Um, so tobacco smoke, cooking odor, paints and solvents, um, gasoline and engines, which is typically what we see in a garage, an attached garage. So you want to make sure you have a really strong separation between the garage and places where you're storing these things in your living environment. Um, cleaning products, new carpets, a lot of, a lot of new, new furniture and these things contain you know, uh, formaldehydes and, and VOCs. So because um, you have these things in your home, more than likely we have these types of pollutants, dust, um, even pollen from, from the um, summer months. All of that stuff gets into your house and it contributes to indoor air pollution. All right, so build the building tight, but you do need to ventilate it, again, to control some of these situations. Now, asbestos insulation, um, if we're doing an audit in an existing home and we find even something that we suspect to be asbestos, you know, we red flag it and we do not do a blower door test because we don't want to start moving air around if we suspect there may be asbestos. Um, but that's something to look for. Um, okay. <clears throat> now I've given away some of this already just by standing up here drawing on about it. But um, what's the biggest factor controlling ice dams in this house? Anybody? Lack of lack of ventilation to the roof, maybe. No, it's, it's actually heat transfer from the house to the attic. Um, and it's amazing that in a lot of commercial buildings, I don't know about the library here, but in a lot of commercial buildings, and doctor's offices and you know, light, light commercial spaces, they're not held to the same code that a home is. And we see a lot of ice dams on those buildings for some reason. 
Well, I know why, because a lot of them have this type of ceiling, as opposed to a hard sheetrock ceiling with a good vapor barrier and air barrier. So they have heat loss to the attic by two means, by air leakage and by conduction. So air sealing and insulating the cap will not only help you know, save energy, but you'll help, remember I mentioned the moisture issue getting to the attic? Will you also stop the ice dam situation? Now we talked about con convection, let's talk about conduction a little bit. Now that's just the heat energy transfer through a solid material, molecule to molecule. Okay, so that's just, you know, a flame under a frying pan cooking it at dex. That's just heat conducting through a cast iron frying pan to the egg, and that's conduction. So most insulation products are designed to stop heat transfer through conduction, conduction, right? So fiberglass, the fluffy stuff, is not a bad insulator. It's actually a pretty decent insulator for conductive purposes, but it does nothing to stop convection. That's why in that box sill we were looking at earlier, we had one picture with a piece of fiberglass poorly installed, and then another one with rigid insulation all sealed in place, because there they're stopping the convective losses and the conductive losses. So in our energy geek world, we talk about insulation and air sealing. Conduction, convection. Okay, so some place, like I just said, some of these materials conduct heat very quickly. They're conductors, right? So metal conducts heat much quicker than wood. So it's a much better conductor of heat transfer. Um, and some materials, like I said, conduct it a lot slower. So, you know, most wood, um, one inch of wood has an R value, which is a, you know, the measure of resistance to heat flow. So most wood has an R value of about one per inch. Um, I don't know who put this question on here. What's better, an inch of solid wood or an inch of fluffy wood? Cellulose is made out of wood fiber, really, so I think that's what they were getting at. So yes, an inch of cellulose is better than an inch of solid wood because the molecules are, are less dense and you have much better resistance to the heat flow through that. Cellulose. Okay, so the higher the R value, the better the insulation. Okay, so like a fiberglass bat is a, an R value when, when installed properly. So remember I said compression and gaps have a lot to do with it. 3.7 per inch for fiberglass. Cellulose is about 3.6. Uh, rigid foam board, depending on the type of foam, has an R value of about four to seven. Again, depending whether it's extruded polystyrene or expanded polystyrene uh, or polyisocyanurate. So those are three different common types of foam. So the blue or pink foam that you see down at the hardware store, um, that's extruded polystyrene and has an R value of five per inch. The white, looks like little white beads all pressed together, the old styrofoam coolers, has an R value of four per inch. And then that rigid foam that we were talking about has the foil coating on it. Most of that is about six and a half to seven <coughs> inch. Um, spray applied foam, spray foams typically have an R value of six to seven per inch. Uh, a double pane window, a new window, has an effective R value of about three. Um, most softwoods, so most framing materials. We, when we do energy modeling, we just about one per inch, but it varies from species of wood from one to another in the density of the wood. A concrete wall, I think R1 is generous. I think concrete is a, is a very poor insulator in almost all circumstances. Now concrete is a great heat sink. You can use concrete to store energy very well. Um, in fact, a lot of people use it in passive solar design they use concrete and stone to absorb heat and then radiate it off to other objects in the room. But an uninsulated piece of concrete will conduct heat very, very quickly. Okay. Um, so new homes built to the 2009 energy code, which is where we're at now in New Hampshire, 2009 IECC. That's the energy code statewide, um, unless you're in Durham, which has adopted a, uh, the 2015 IECC, so they're in a higher code than the rest of the state. 
Um, but typically attics need to be insulated to either R38 or R49 to meet current code. Most existing homes, um, homes built in the 70s, will be lucky if you have R13 maybe in the attic. So you can see there's huge opportunities for savings in most attics. Uh, current code is R20 in walls. Um, if, if you're living in a home that was built prior to, say, mid-80s, you probably have two by four walls as opposed to a two by six wall, um, which means you're not gonna have much more than R13 in your above grade walls. Um, foundation walls or basement walls, if it's heated space. If it's unheated space, you don't have to insulate it, but um, by code, it's gonna be either R15 to R29, depending on whether you're in the northern part of the state or the southern part of the state. Um, but the average, new, like I said, the average New Hampshire home has an existing R factor, R value of R10 to R30, depending on the age of the home. It's probably the, the biggest factor that impacts that. Walls, either R3 to R16, and basement walls, I would say R0, really, for, you know, bare concrete, um, to R5, if there's any sort of uh, material, a studded wall with some sort of insulation on it. Um, okay, so <clears throat> kind of a trick question here, but uh, what's the average R value of an attic with R38 insulation covering 95% of the area? So if you have most of the attic that's R38, but you have an area maybe the attic hatch, there's a lot of people do, do most of you have attic hatches in your home? Does the attic hatch have any insulation on it? And if so, how much? Um, if we're trying to achieve you know, R49 or R40, let's keep the math simple. If we're trying to achieve R49 consistently across the whole attic, how do you get your attic hatch there? You can't pile up cellulose on top of the attic hatch and expect it to stay there every time you move the hatch, right? So in new construction, we typically uh, recommend that you get rigid insulation. And most of it comes in two inch thicknesses, so that means you'd have to get multiple layers of it. So the blue or pink foam is R5 per inch. So two, four, six, eight, eight inches of that at five would get you to R40. It does make the attic hatch a little heavier, but it would address that 95% of the attic being at R38 or whatever you're trying to achieve. Um, but that heat, if you, it doesn't average out, and that's the point of this question, the average R value. You take you did that simple math, 38 and 95 percent of the attic. It's much more skewed towards R30 than you would think. It's not an arithmetic average. It's a weighted average, and it's weighted towards the lower R value. <clears throat> okay. So blown-in attic insulation. Um, you want at least 12 to 16 inches if you're using cellulose. If you're using blown-in fiberglass which has a lower R value per inch on the blown in stuff, you'd want to go thicker. You want at least 16 to 18 inches of blown fiberglass. Now if you have, oops, if you have cribbing up here, you need a place to store your Christmas decorations, um, you may actually have to crib this up in order to get the, the depth before you deck it over. Otherwise you're gonna be limited to whatever the thickness of that framing is. So if you fill that up with insulation and put some you know, decking across it, that's it, that's all you're gonna get for insulation unless you add some framing to get the deck up higher so that you can get the added insulation up under that decking. <clears throat> okay, so, you know, I've gone to a house to do an audit and they said, oh, we wanna do an energy audit, we wanna seal the house, we wanna make our house more energy efficient. And I said, whoa, 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 before you do anything, you have to stop the river that's running through the, the rubble foundation through the dirt floor in the basement. Um, so, yeah, you want to stop the moisture problems first before you do the <laughs> Yeah, somebody asked a question about fire barriers. Yeah, yeah, so foam does need a fire barrier. So if you're using foam to do a whole wall assembly like this, you would have to cover that with something in order to meet the fire code. But um, if, you if you just put it in between the joists. Like in the up, up in the box? Yeah. You can cover it with a bat. A lot of people will cut the foam in there, seal it in place, yeah. and then put some fiberglass over it. What the fiberglass does is it acts as a spark, an ignition barrier. Okay. Um, so even spray foam. If you were doing an unfinished 
um, you know, kind of a utility space. You could actually use spray foam down there like this, but they require that you cover it with an intermittent paint, which acts as an ignition barrier. So if a spark hits it, it'll catch that as a fire. Okay. Um, dense pack cellulose, air seals. Now, I disagree with that a little bit, but dense pack cellulose will slow down air movement and do a, a better job slowing down air infiltration or that convective loss in a building, but technically cellulose is not an air impermeable material. It's still air permeable. Air will still go through cellulose, but it does, it is more dense when it's dense packed into a cavity like this. So what this, this <coughs> photo is here showing somebody where they've removed um, a couple of the clapboards off this house and then drilled a hole and they do it in each stud cavity so that they can stick the hose in they dense pack the wall cavity from the top, and then they dense pack it from the bottom, and they fill up. So a lot of these older homes had no insulation in them. So they pull off a clapboard like that, put the hose in, and then and then blow in cellulose and fill in those cavities. And it will it will stop some convective losses, but technically technically it's not a, uh, an air barrier. So what would you recommend with an older home that has no insulation? That probably is the most effective way to do it. It really is. Um, no, I, what I was just getting at is it says it air seals, and it will do some air sealing, but technically cellulose is not an air barrier. Um, there was a product out there for a while, kind of a retrofit foam, where you could inject foam into those spaces, just like cellulose, and their marketing niche was that the foam would expand and if there was something already in the wall, like a very ineffective fiberglass, it would compress it and push it out of the way and replace it with this injection foam. Um, I didn't see a, a lot of use of that foam out there. And, you know, it was a product that was out there and starting to get a little traction, but I don't see it. I think it might have been cost prohibitive, maybe it was too expensive when you had other options like this. Okay. So what about windows, all right? There's many reasons to replace windows. Um, typically, energy savings is not one of the reasons to replace windows, usually. Not in every case, but in most cases. So let's look at windows here. Let's say a new window, as I pointed out earlier, has an R value of maybe three, maybe four, maybe five. For a really good triple pane window, you might get to R5. And your existing window might have, I always think of windows in terms of U value, so I'm gonna flip this around on you a little bit. An R value of three is a U value of 0.3, right? That's 0.3 BTUs per hour. It's a measure of heat loss, right? <clears throat> so a new window with a U value of 0.3 versus an older window with maybe a U value of one, is an R value of one. So you go from an R value of one to an R value of three, or a U value of 0.3 to one. That's not a lot of energy savings, really. Maybe it is if the window is free. But most windows are, the last time I bought a window, it cost me $300 for one window. And then I had to install it myself. If I had to pay someone to install it, that would have been another $300. So, to go from an R value of one to an R value of three at $600 a window times, how many windows, 20 windows, 10 windows maybe, it's gonna take a long time for that energy savings to pay off that investment. And that's why we say, if we go and do an audit, we'll prioritize the list of improvements from those that pay back the quickest to those that pay back the longest. And typically windows are a long payback because of the cost and the relative um, uh, low energy savings. All right, but like I said, there's other ways to address leaky windows. And like I said, a, a single pane window, metal frame, um, yeah, is very inefficient. Um, but there's ways to address that without necessarily replacing the whole window. And you may want to do it for other reasons. Maybe it's not very operable. Um, you know, maybe it just doesn't look good and there's other reasons to replace it. But um, you can add window treatments and there's different types of um, thermal 
thermal drapes and thermal type of window treatments that you can use um, to reduce energy loss through and around windows. All right, so heating systems, replacing filters. Does anybody ever replace their air filter on their HVAC system? Very seldom, especially when I see the, the air handler, you know, buried in one of the deepest, darkest, cavernous areas of an attic somewhere or a basement. And I know nobody else, nobody goes in there to replace that filter. Um, but test and clean um, you know, existing oil and gas systems. You want to have them tested for combustion safety as well. Okay, so backdrafting flue gases. Now this could be a health and safety concern. Um, so before, most energy auditors, when they'll come in and do a, a test, they'll test in, test out. Um, but before they tighten the building, they want to do a combustion safety test and find out, first of all, is the, is the atmospheric draft equipment already a problem before they even start? And they want to identify that. Um, but most home performance professionals will do this. They'll test that for combustion safety, make sure it's drafting properly, to make sure that it's combusting to a point where it's not creating a carbon monoxide issue. Um, the simplest thing you can do is make sure that all your carbon monoxide detectors in the home are installed and functional. Okay? Um, they do wear out over time, and I've had to replace some of my carbon monoxide detectors. Make sure the batteries, you get fresh batteries. Okay, some other mechanical systems, uh, ductless mini splits for air conditioning. They have cold climate heat pumps, so we actually see some of these installed in new construction now. Um, heat pump hot water heaters, which if you have an electric water heater, a heat pump electric hot water heater is an electric water heater, all right? So a lot of times people use electric water heaters because they don't want to have to vent a gas fired product. So an electric heat pump water heater, it's still just a wire coming to it, but it has a compressor on it. And the way they work, it's kind of like an air conditioner in reverse. Instead of taking the, um, the warm air and dumping it to the outside, the, hot, the heat pump water heater takes the warm air and dumps it into the water, but it does expel some cold air. Okay. Um, I like the idea of a heat pump water heater. My electric water heater, when it dies, I'm going to go heat pump. Um, and the reason is because I mentioned it does produce a little bit of cooling because it's taking the warm ambient air, condensing it through refrigerants and putting it into the water, not the refrigerant, but the warm, the, the heat, um, and expelling cold air. So it is making the basement a little cooler, but in the summertime, it's doing a little more dehumidification too. So that reduces the amount of dehumidification I need to do in the basement in the summertime. Okay, so NHSA's rebates um, are available for mini splits and air conditioning. I think most of the utilities have, have uh, exhausted their funds this year. I think New Hampshire Electric Co-op uh, still has funds available. Um, this chart was developed as of September, so I think maybe even, even the co-op has probably dwindled a little bit at this point. So yeah. regarding the rebates, if, um, if somebody tonight decides to do something, can they wait? January yes. is that when the new monies get released? Correct. Yep. Good time. Yep. <clears throat> yep. So yeah, every year um, the utilities get a new budget starting in January. It starts their new budget cycle. All right. So the mini splits, uh, gas fired. If you're on natural gas, there are rebates available for natural gas boilers, furnaces, and hot water heaters. Um, I believe this funding is relative to the electric measures. I think the gas utilities still have. Um, rebates available, but again, they get new budgets in January. Um, smart thermostats and Wi-Fi thermostats, um, there's rebates available for those and also for heat pump hot water heaters. And then there are some utility specific initiatives out there. I think there, there are some that have on-bill financing, there's some funding available, and there are some things that are utility specific. But um, Okay, so they put together these kind of do-it-yourself packages that, and they have them prioritized. So the first priority would be like the $100, what they've identified as $100 do-it-yourself investment. Um, so LED light bulbs, low flow shower heads and aerators, simple air sealing in the attic and the basement, and using smart power strips. Okay, so those, that's, those are like the priority one, kind of the lowest cost things that you can do yourself. 
okay? Um, priority two might be stepping up. Do a little more strategic air sealing in the attic and the basement. You know, step it up. Um, using smart thermostats, that's gonna require maybe some, you know, some skilled person to come in and wire that. Um, pipe insulation where needed. Using duct sealing with mastic. Now these are a little more intensive, a little, a little more involved, a little more crawling around in, in you know, attics and basements to get to the duct work. Um, using window treatments, okay? So without replacing your windows, just using the cellular, the cellular insulating shades, you know, the honeycomb shades that I had a photo of a minute ago. Um, so these things cost a little bit more. Is there a value? What's that? Is, is there an R value on those cellular shades, or do you just buy? You know, I don't know shades? if they if they have a rated R value on them, but buy. yeah, they are insulated, so they they do have some sort of resistance to heat flow. I, what that R value is, I couldn't tell you. Um, and home performance with Energy Star. I, this is a, a utility sponsored program. Um, I highly recommend it. If people call me for an energy audit, I said, yeah, I can, I can come out and do an energy audit for you, but I recommend that they start with the utilities NA Saves home performance program first. Uh, and the reason I point you in that direction is because they'll send an auditor out uh, to do the audit uh, for $100 up front. So you might have to pay out of pocket $100 for that audit. Um, they'll go through the house from top to bottom, do a little combustion safety testing, and then they'll come up with a list of recommendations. And if you follow their list of recommendations, you'll get that $100 back in your rebate, and they'll cover half the cost of their, the retrofit, up to $4,000. Right. So if you have an $8,000 insulation and air sealing job, they'll cover half that cost. Can I tell you that I did that um, two or three years ago, so we, we had the audit and then yes, we picked $3,800 worth of goodies and they matched us $3,800, so my house went from R19 to R65 and I only paid $3,800. Yeah. What is the qualification if qualified? What does that mean? It's kind of, a, on the, well, he can describe it. Yep. Door test is I, I think I have a slide that explains it up here, oh, but okay. you have to, know. the first step is to go to NH Saves, one sec, and and you put in your zip code and you enter in your, your estimated annual energy use, even if you use cordwood. Put in four cords or whatever you use for cordwood, how many kilowatt hour you use if you have electric heat. Um, they will want to see your, your, your bills to back this up to qualify. But, and it'll just measure whether you're a high, you know, your energy use index, and it'll measure whether you're a high energy user or a low energy user. You know, there's not a lot of you know, flex there if you're you know, kind of a Snowbird, you're not there half the time, you might not have the energy usage that you need to demonstrate that high use, but. Um, okay, so then you get, you know, the, the higher cost, maybe call it a, a deep energy retrofit, or now you're getting in doing a little more surgery and you're, you know, peeling off, you know, pieces of framing and siding in order to get to the areas that you need to air seal. Okay. Now when you get to that level of tightness, now you start talking about adding new ventilation systems and, and start to, Get into a little more involved stuff. Okay. Um, again, okay, so that's that's where you say working with energy professionals. So someone's going to come in and do combustion safety testing, a written report, um, and do a complete building envelope inspection. They may or may not use infrared, um, but a lot of the auditors out there have infrared cameras and they can help identify these things. So like we do a blower door test, which measures the leak that, leaky or tightness of a building. Um, we know where to go to find the leaks. We know, okay, we know there's gonna be a leak along that baseboard. We know there's gonna be a leak around the attic hatch. Um, but then there's maybe some other areas that you can't really say, well, that's, you didn't expect to see it there. And using the blower door with the infrared camera, you get a visual image and you can actually see the infiltration. You'll see the dark, cold streaks coming in in infrared using it with the blower door, okay? This is the blower door. Has anybody not seen this before? Okay, great. I work with you know a lot of new construction, so it's becoming more common in new construction to have this test done to demonstrate code compliance. But in existing homes, you really wouldn't see this unless you had an audit done. So the way it works is it's an expandable frame that we set up in the exterior opening in a building. It's typically a door, right? And with this fan, 
we depressurize the house. So we're, we're blowing air out. Yeah, you can do it under positive pressure, but we usually do it under negative pressure. So we, we blow the air out with all the other windows and doors closed, <clears throat> we end up with a negative pressure on our flow gauge. Long story short, what we end up with, it measures the cubic feet per minute you know, at that 50 pascals of pressure. So we hold the house to 50 pascals of pressure. We measure 3,000 CFM of air moving through the fan. We know there's 3,000 CFM being sucked in through all the little holes and crevices in the building around can lights, around attic hatches, around um, electric outlets and, and switch plate covers. And those are typical places where we see the air infiltration reveal themselves. <clears throat> All right. So it'll, it'll give us a, a leakage. It'll say, wow, okay, it's for a house this size and this volume, you know, that, that CFM leakage may be a lot. You know, if we did a blower door test on this whole building here, this whole library, um, and we ended up with 3,000 CFM, you, that might not be a bad number relative to the volume of the building. Uh, 3,000 CFM on a typical single family home is a lot of leakage. Most, most new homes now are at about four, about four and a half to five air changes without even trying to do any air sealing. That's most new construction. <clears throat> Okay, so I mentioned infrared images. So this is you know, some of the tools of the auditor. Um, they'll use these. I, I typically use mine with a blower door. So if, if there was a leak, say, up in this corner, you'd see that dark purple streak because it would look like a fan tail. It would just kind of, you'd see streaking. And that's the cold air being drawn in. So using it with conjunction with the blower door uh, is a great way to help identify um, air leakage. But even without the blower door, you can see here that maybe there's a little compression in these areas. Here, you usually have a stud coming in here. There's usually another piece of framing material coming here. So the corners are usually going to show up darker anyway because you have a lot of framing all coming together at that point. So therefore, you have very little insulation where you have all that wood, where you have an R value of one per inch with the insulation next to it is <coughs> an R value of about three or four per inch. So what do you do for that? In, in often cases, there's very little you can do. In new construction, a lot of the Energy Star programs now, they, they ask you to address some of that, what we call thermal bridging through the framing by either using less framing, you know, space things out a little more, um, leave the corners open so you have a, an open stud corner so that you can get insulation into the corner, um, or wrapping the building in rigid insulation. And in some new construction products projects, we're starting to see that, where not only they insulate the cavities, but then they wrap the whole building in rigid insulation. And so now they're basically insulating around all the frames. Um, okay, so home energy improvements, you know, some of the improvement services, air sealing, insulation, heat system improvements. Most home performance contractors address this, and then sometimes they have to bring in another contractor, another subcontractor to deal with the HVAC, the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, um, and then moisture control. So again, air sealing and insulation, a lot of that's done at the same time by just controlling the moisture and ventilation. Sometimes it requires different, uh, different trades and different skills and different craftsmen to come in and control things. You might need somebody that's you know, that can air seal a basement, and now you may need someone that does concrete work. You might need someone that does some carpentry and some framing. But for the most part, the home performance contractors, most of them work through New Hampshire uh, NH Sage program. They can they can deal all that air sealing, and like Renee mentioned, in her own home. Did you notice a, a difference on your bill, by the way? Mm -hmm. You said it was two or three years ago you had that done. Yeah. And have, have you noticed a substantial savings on? on the spot. <laughs> well, actually, my husband deals with that, but I've noticed a substantial warmth. There we go. So this is comfort. Very improvement. crafty. Yeah, it's yeah. built in like 1975. You know, it's, yeah. yeah. And if you have a comfort improvement, we can only surmise that you probably also have some dollar savings as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> okay, so some of the credentials to look for if you're having a home performance contractor coming into your house to do some work. Um, when, when, when all this started to take effect back in early 2000s, late 90s, it was kind of a wild west and you know anybody with a blower door and some foam can come out and you know make energy improvements um, but they really wanted to standardize the process what to look for 
um, and kind of a do no harm kind of uh, mentality in terms of home improvement. Um, so look for building improvement. This is a building performance contractor uh, institute, building performance institute. Um, BPI, that's a common certification. I, I believe it's required by the NH saves. Yeah, okay. NH saves requires that BPI contractors are either, um, I'm sorry, but NH saves requires that they're either BPI certified or a ResNet home energy rater. Now in new construction, doing the Energy Star certifications, you know, my, my group at GDS, they're uh, ResNet certified energy raters. You can ask them. You can ask them for what tools they use. Do they have combustion analyzers? Do you have an infrared camera? Do you have a blower door test? Uh, a blower door. Do you have a duct leakage uh, test equipment? You can ask for references. Um, ask what their experience is. <clears throat> this is a great site. The uh, and I'm not just saying that because I'm a past president or board member, but REPA, the Residential Energy Performance Association in New Hampshire. The members of that, all the members on that list are fully vetted. So in order to become a member, it is somewhat rigorous, and we've had a lot of criticism for making it such a tight network and making it difficult to get in. Um, but the reason we do that is to make sure that our members are fully vetted before they end up on our website list of direct, you know, directory of um, qualified professionals. If I'm going to hire somebody, I want to find, I want to hire somebody who has gone through a very serious series of Oops. Right, and that the, the ResNet certification and the building performance, that alone, and that's why they came up with it. And we, we developed the REPA organization before BPI was even in existence. And this is a very New Hampshire specific group. It was set up, you know, as the utilities were first starting to roll out programs back in 2000. And this hadn't even come along yet. And then since then, this has become a national uh, certification. And it's a, it is a great curriculum. Um, okay, so for new homes, I mentioned Energy Star is a great certification. It's a third party. Um, that, that's what we spend most of our time doing. Is um, we're you know we're that hers rater that comes in and does that does that third party verification. Um, right now, so the utilities have a uh, an incentive program for that new construction program. Um, they also, on top of that program, they have a competitive program, a first, second, third place prize, and they're calling it to the Drive to Net Zero competition. Um, so I'm not sure if we talked about HERS ratings in this presentation or not, but um, the energy rating, with this HERS, Home Energy Rating System, it's a zero to 100 point score. Um, the lower you, the number, the better. So the closer you get to zero, the closer you get to net zero. Um, most most code homes now are probably in the 80 HERS rating, 70 to 80 HERS rating. Um, and the way the utilities work their rebate program is the lower the number, the more rebate money you get, essentially. Without going into too much detail, the better score you get, the more rebate. So that's, the rebates are really tied to the performance. Um, and to drive to net zero, the closer the house gets to zero, it's, like I said, it's a competitive um, program right now where they're, they're com competing one home against another for that first, second, third place prize. Okay. Um, there's income qualified program. So uh, if you're on fuel assistance or if you have, you know, working through your cap agencies um, for financial assistance, um, so there's programs for, for, for those, those homes. Um, so, again, we use a ton of energy. How are we using energy? Knowing how you use energy first is, is a great place to start. So take your utility bill, break it down. Then start looking at the ABCs, you know, where your air sealing. Prioritize things. Um, add insulation where you can. So air seal, add your insulation. If you have insulation in place, when I insulated my, the cap, I had to remove my insulation first so I could see what I was dealing with in terms of air sealing. I air sealed it, and then I put the insulation back and then added more to it. Um, and keep your home safe. So like I said, controlling, controlling moisture, that's, that's a first step. Um, making sure your combustion appliances, if you really tighten the home 
and you're relying on a drafty home for your atmospheric draft water heater to draw properly, you want to make sure that that's addressed before, during, and after um, making the improvements.